Hello, all of my history-loving friends. Welcome to the world of Madame Morbid. This is a history channel where we talk about any number of interesting historical topics that may have a little dark side to them. Some of them, not all. Today, we are going to talk about Margaret Brown. You know her better as Molly. That's a name that was invented for her for the 1960s musical and movie because Molly is easier to sing. History remembers her now as Molly. That's how everybody got to know her. But tonight we're going to call her what she was actually called, either Margaret or Maggie. People who knew her very well called her Maggie. She became famous because of Titanic. And we talked about Titanic last week with the survival story of Charles Lightoller, who was the second officer of Titanic. He put Margaret into a boat that night, Lifeboat 6. We'll be talking about that later. Right now, I want to talk about her life leading up to Titanic. Margaret was born July 18th, 1867, the daughter of John and Joanna Tobin. They were Irish immigrants. They had come because of the potato famine. They had fled to the United States. Her father had some role in the Civil War, but it's really not known exactly what he did or what unit he fought for. Her father was a laborer. He worked for the Hannibal Gas Works. When Margaret was born, they were living in Hannibal, Missouri. Her mother and father had both had marriages before they married each other and their spouses had died. Each had one child from those relationships. Her father had a daughter, Catherine, and her mother had a daughter, Marianne, who were her half sisters. They were quite a bit older, 11 to 13 years older than Maggie. Maggie was the oldest born of her parents. Then she, her brother Daniel was born and her younger sister Helen. Maggie was so close to her family her entire life. Very, very family oriented. They were staunch Irish Catholics. They lived at the corner of Dinkler Avenue and Prospect Street. The grammar school she attended until the age of 13 was across the street at Mary O'Leary's Grammar School. It was located on Prospect Street, right across from their house. And Mary O'Leary was her mother's sister. Unlike the legend, which shows her as an uneducated hick, she had just as much education as anyone else normal for that time. And in some cases, she had more because of what she learned from her aunt. She was a very active and curious child. She loved playing with her siblings. They lived very close to the Mississippi River and it would have been great fun, I'm sure, to go and watch the steamboats churning down the river, watching them come in and dock and unload their cargo. She played in the mud, just like the boys. At the age of 13, which was very common for children of this era, she had to go and get a job to help support the family. She took a job at Garth's Tobacco Factory. Probably what she was doing was picking leaves or stripping the leaves. It seems she probably worked in this factory for several years. She worked there long enough to know that she wanted something better for her life. Her dream was to get a nice house for her father so that he didn't have to work himself to death anymore, that he would have a nice place where he could put up his feet and rest and relax for a bit because all she ever saw him do was work. She was very close with her father and her mother, but she had a very deep fondness for her father. She doesn't know it, but that dream will come true. The only way she really sees this being a possibility is to find a wealthy husband because there wasn't a job on earth that a woman could do to make money. It's unknown how she got the idea to travel to Colorado to go to Leadville, but it probably came from her sister, Marianne, who had moved there with her husband. Leadville, Colorado at this time was booming. They had had mining strikes there, they had found silver, and everybody was flocking there for a chance to hit it big in their own mining operation. By the time she got there, that was largely over, and most men who went there ended up working for a large mining company. She traveled there by train with her brother, Daniel. Helen went with them, but she wasn't quite old enough to leave home yet. She was just going to visit Marianne and then she would return home after the visit. I'm sure Leadville, Colorado came as quite a shock 
to young Margaret, who had only ever been in Hannibal, it would have been a place with a lot more vice. There were just as many saloons as there were churches. I'm sure men probably far outnumbered women. They probably behaved quite coarsely. For a time, she was living with Marianne and her husband, and Daniel lived with them as well, and they all were contributing to the cost of living. She got a job at a dry goods store in town making draperies and carpets. She is said to have been a wonderful employee, wonderful to work with. She was a very nice person. She cared about other people. She was a hard worker. And even after she got extremely wealthy, she continued to, to visit Leadville and to meet with the people she used to work with and to see how they were doing and to say hello. Maggie and her family were very staunch Irish Catholics and very active in the church in Hannibal. When she got to Leadville, she also got very involved with the church. It was at a picnic held at the church that she met James Joseph Brown. He was a minor. He was not a wealthy man by any means, but she fell for him pretty quickly and he fell for her. He was charismatic. He was extremely handsome. He was slightly older than her, 12, 13 years, her senior. He was higher in rank than your average minor though. He did have more of a managerial position. He had worked his way up in the mining industry and he'd been very smart about it. He had studied geology and mineralogy. That is a hard word to say. They were married pretty quickly after a whirlwind romance. They took a honeymoon to a nearby resort, came back and set up house. She wasn't living in luxury. She was probably a little better off than the average miner's family. They had a comfortable existence, but he was not a rich man, which is what she had sort of been aiming for. But once she fell in love, she ultimately made the decision that it was far more important to marry someone you actually loved and had feelings for than to just marry someone for their money. These days were the happiest of their entire lives. The money didn't make them happier. They both looked very fondly back on this period of their life. Their first child was born within a year of their marriage, Lawrence Palmer Brown. He was born in Hannibal. Maggie went back home to be with her mother through the birth. By the time their second daughter, Catherine Ellen, was born, the whole family had moved to Leadville to be near one another. It was a happy time, but not everything would remain fantastic for the people of Leadville. Politically, during this period, there was a big issue whether the United States would go by the gold standard or there was another more progressive group led by William Jennings Bryan that advocated for the free coinage of silver. Both JJ and Margaret were very supportive of William Jennings Bryan. He ran for president multiple times. He never won, obviously. For a while, the price of silver was propped up by a law called the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. When Grover Cleveland becomes president, he is a very staunch gold standard supporter, and he has that law repealed. When this happens, the price of silver plummets into the basement. Mines shut down. Within a year, 90% of the miners in Leadville have lost their jobs. JJ does not because he has a more leadership position. He's working for the Ibex mine. He is helping them find, open up new mines. Margaret jumps into action to try to help some of the suffering people in Leadville. She helps with soup kitchens to get toys for children who will get nothing at Christmas, finding clothing and things that people are going to need through the winters. Meanwhile, JJ is working with the Ibex mine and there's a mine called the Little Johnny Mine that they've been wanting to get into. But the soil keeps collapsing in and they cannot safely get inside. JJ comes up with this idea of just shoring up the walls with hay bales and timber and he gets the entrance safe enough that they can get down in there and see what's in this mine. And they make a massive gold strike. Suddenly everything turns around in Leadville and especially for Margaret and JJ. For what he has done, he has given 12,500 shares of 30,000 of stock in the Ibex Mining Company. Overnight, they are rich. 
And like a lot of executives, they relocate to Pennsylvania Avenue in Denver, to the House of Lions, which is now the Molly Brown House Museum. I want to go there so bad someday. They move into this house and they make a few changes to it. Their children are still very young. And some of the main goals that Margaret has for herself is she wants to educate herself. She has now become a part of the upper classes and she wants to sound like she is part of the upper classes. She would have had an accent similar to mine. I grew up an hour south of St. Louis. Hannibal is more north. She would not have sounded like a dumb hick as she is often portrayed in movies and such. At worst, this is the accent she would have had. She took elocution lessons. She learned how to speak like a lady. She learned how to behave like a lady. She is said to have had excellent posture, to hold herself very straight and regal. So she would have been very well-spoken. She was able to keep up a conversation with pretty much anybody, very intelligent conversations. She was not a stupid, uneducated woman in any way. She was very interested in learning other languages. By the time of Titanic in 1912, she could speak several languages fluently. She wanted her children to get very good educations, so she put them in boarding schools. She actually wanted them to be educated in Europe. And at one point, her daughter would actually be enrolled in the Sorbonne in France. Margaret was obsessed with France and French culture. She adored Paris of every place she ever visited. She spent a great deal of her life once getting money traveling. She went all over the world. JJ traveled a lot too, but not so much international travel. He was traveling constantly for his mining business. Margaret was not shunned by Denver society. As a matter of fact, she got a tremendous amount of attention in the society papers in Denver. And she was a very important force in Denver's political world. She was so involved in charitable causes. She raised money. She was actually one of the first publicists in history. She was so good at organizing events and getting publicity for events and raising money. Along with Ben Lindsay, Margaret Brown is somewhat responsible for the juvenile court system we have today. She met Ben Lindsay, who was an attorney. Early in his career, he, he was working as a defense attorney and he said he was sent over. He said, you're going to be representing these two robbery suspects. We want you to go over to the prison and meet with them. So he went over there and there were four people there. There were two very dangerous looking men. And he thought they were his clients, but actually it was two little boys who were with these men. And he's thinking, what are these nine and 10 year old children doing in jail with these clearly hardened criminals? All we're doing, if we convict these children of robbery at nine and 10 years old and send them into a prison with guys like this, we are literally sending them in to learn how to be good criminals, professional criminals for the rest of their life. They will never get out of what's happening to them right now. They will have felonies and their life will be over. He was going to do something about this system because it wasn't just these little boys. It was all of the children all over the country who were being put in prisons next to rapists, murderers, and thieves to learn how to be professional criminals. Together with Margaret, Margaret was his fundraiser. She was his publicist. She was out there raising money specifically for his charities. And as time went on, laws were passed based on Ben Lindsay's arguments, barring children from being put into prisons with adults, barring children from being charged as adults to put them places where they were safe, where they were fed, where they were cared for and where they were taught better ways rather than sending them to a future of a hardened criminal life. Margaret actually bought a mine, one that was not active at the time. Every cent this mine made went to Ben Lindsay and caring for the children that he was advocating for. Other charitable causes that Margaret was very involved in and cared a lot about, she was very active in the church. She raised money to have a cathedral built right there in Denver. It remains a major historical landmark in Denver to this day. 
She raised money to open a new wing of the Catholic hospital in Denver. She was constantly bringing things back from her travels for the Denver Museum. She was a member of many women's clubs as well. Women had no political power at this time. Women did have some voting rights in Colorado that women nationwide did not have. But in order to really feel like they were making a difference, all over the country there were the formation of these women's clubs that sought to make changes in society for charitable causes. Some of the clubs that Margaret was a member of did things like build playgrounds for underprivileged children, help people get medical care, keeping people fed, these sorts of things. Every year she was put in charge of the Catholic fair. One time she arranged and put together a, she called it the Carnival of Nations. In 1893, she had gone to the World's Fair with her family, with JJ and the children, and they had seen this amazing, the white city in Chicago. Every World's Fair always had all of these booths for all of these different cultures that were supposed to show you what those cultures were like. Now, in a lot of cases, they were just kind of racist stereotypes not politically correct by our standards of today, but she was really inspired by this and she did wanted to do the same thing in Denver. She was very disturbed by the fact that Chinese people had built the Transcontinental Railroad, but they were not allowed to ride the railroad they built. The same with American Indians. A lot of people wanted to pretend like they didn't even exist. And when they did exist, there was a desire to strip them of their culture. They were stealing their children, putting them in these jails, basically these schools, they called them schools, where they were cutting off their hair and trying to erase their culture from them. These were things that were in her mind and what was being, what was happening to African-Americans. Today, we would call this living history. All of these things were fundraisers to raise money for various charitable causes. There were two things that were Margaret's absolute favorite beautiful clothing, and traveling. And Margaret was in the society papers most for descriptions of her beautiful Paris gowns. Almost everything she wore was designed in Paris by a special designer that worked just for her to make her clothing. And she was often ahead of her time. She would do things that weren't considered proper. There's a story that one time another wealthy lady went up to her and said something to the effect of, oh, look at that woman over there wearing diamonds in the middle of the day. Can you imagine? It's just so improper. And Margaret is said to have replied, I used to think that too until I owned diamonds. So she really didn't care what anyone thought about anything she did or said. One gossip columnist who initially really went after Margaret in her paper was Polly Pry. Polly Pry had actually been a very gifted, hard-hitting journalist at one point in her career, but she had fallen on hard times in her career and she started this paper on her own. And as time went on, she actually became very good friends with Margaret Brown. She was very supportive of the causes that Margaret was advocating for, again, supporting her in her newspaper. They became good personal friends. The family had a farm Margaret named it Avoca. They adored this farm. JJ experimented in raising chickens. He is apparently said to have been extremely dedicated to his chickens. And they had lovely times at this farm for many years. Margaret bought a cottage in Newport, Rhode Island. She really enjoyed staying in Newport. She made some great friends there. The Vanderbilts had a cottage. Their cottage would have been so much larger than Margaret's. In the scheme of things, she and JJ were small potatoes next to people like the Vanderbilts. She made some great friendships and connections with some very powerful people, including the Rockefellers, JJ Astor and his wife, Madeline. Margaret enrolled herself in college. Andrew Carnegie had disposed of his fortune at the end of his life toward all of these charitable donations. Most towns have a Carnegie library that he paid for all over the country. He also opened a college in which women were very welcome. And Margaret signed up to be in one of these first classes. She was studying art and literature, acting and languages. 
like I said before, she found that she was very gifted at speaking other languages. This is not a trait I share with her. I am terrible at it. But this skill, when, when she learns all of these languages, comes in very handy after the Titanic disaster as she helps communicate with all of these steerage passengers who speak all kinds of different languages. While she is in school though, something very humiliating happens to their family. It comes out in the newspapers that JJ has been caught in infidelity. It is a scandal and she's humiliated. He's traveling, like I said, a lot. It's sort of like what happens with rock stars and comedians, people who travel on the road a lot and sometimes are not faithful to their wives. And he was one of them. There were a lot of fissures forming in their marriage. He didn't like that Margaret was constantly in the newspapers, whether it be the society papers or just the newspapers in general with her political activism. He didn't think women belonged there. In his mind, women should be in the newspaper four times, when they're born, when they get engaged, when they get married, and when they die. He disagreed with Margaret on a lot of her political stances as well. When it came to a mining strike, she was much more likely to side with the workers. Whereas he, being an executive, he sides with management and the company. She also threw lavish parties at their house. Some of it for charity, but some of it also just because parties were fun. At a lot of these parties, he would just cloister himself in his office and not really want to take part. They did try to save their marriage though. As devout Irish Catholics, they had no interest in getting divorced. And no matter how bad it got, they never did get divorced. She and JJ go on a vacation. They leave the children with relatives and they travel the world. It is said to have been a very enjoyable trip. They went to India and Egypt and had a wonderful time just trying to mend their relationship, to get closer to one another, and to get over this shame and the scandal. But once they came home, their problems were just waiting for them again. Around 1909, they legally separated. They did not publicize this, but he lived his life and she lived hers. She does not seem to have ever shown any interest in finding another romantic partner, whereas JJ continued his ways. His personality also changed. He began having a series of strokes and it made him more, it made him have bouts of temper, very severe bouts of temper. It seems to have changed his personality, probably from things he encountered in the mines, I'm sure had a role in his declining health at a pretty early age, around 44, 45, he is being told by doctors, you need to retire or you're going to die. Maggie's just in her early thirties when this happens. She's certainly not ready to throw in the towel on her career. Yes, she's not allowed to have a career, but she certainly wants to be involved in things and change the world if she can. Right before Titanic, Margaret and her daughter, Helen, were on a, a year long trip. They had been to Paris. They went to Cairo, Egypt. Part of this trip there at the end when they were in Cairo, they were with John Jacob Astor and his new wife, Madeline, who they were on their honeymoon. No one really knew that Madeline was pregnant yet. And they were trying to escape this huge scandal of this much older man getting divorced from his wife and marrying a woman who was half his age, not much older than his son. Margaret had bought a huge new wardrobe. Helen had had this beautiful silver dress specially woven for her by artists in Cairo just for her. All of these beautiful new dresses would go to the bottom of the ocean. She had also bought crates of antiquities. She bought models of famous landmarks, Roman ruins and Roman cities that she was taking back to the Denver Museum. She was asked about insuring these things and she refused, saying it wasn't necessary. Her son had gotten married a year before, in 1911. He married a young woman named Eileen, and they had had a little boy, Lawrence Palmer Jr. They called him Ted. Little Ted grew ill. He was only five months old or so, and Margaret hadn't even seen him because she was in Europe when he was born. They send her a wire while she is in Paris and let her know that little Lawrence is sick 
At the last minute, she drops everything and books passage back to America. She books passage with J.J. Astor and his party, so they all booked passage on Titanic. She was really excited about this. It was the maiden voyage. It was with Captain Smith. She traveled with him before. He had sat at her table when she was on the Olympic Titanic sister ship. Helen decided to stay in France with her friends. There were very few people who actually knew Margaret was on board Titanic. The only people who knew this really were her children. Lawrence, who knew she was coming back because of his son, and Helen, who knew that she had left 